But anyway, let's uh, just be alive in Him this morning. It's all right. It's okay to be happy in the house of the Lord. Because when you walk out of this door, there's problems, there's concerns that are going to affront you. And you need to fill up with everything that you can receive in His house so that you can get through the things that are going to happen this week. How many want that? I know that I do. I want the strength to carry me. We go from strength to strength, faith to faith, strength to strength, and we can make it through everything with His power invested in us. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Kings. Just about a third of the way through the Bible. 1 Kings 19. I had about three or four messages, and I'm only going to preach one this morning. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah. One's enough. How many know that one's enough for now? 1 Kings 19, beginning in verse 1. And as we read this, hopefully you will be able to relate to some of this yourself even before we get into the message. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. When he saw that, he rose and went for his life, and came to Bathsheba, that belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under the juniper tree, behold, her look, an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water at his side, at his head. And he did eat and drink, and lay him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he rose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mountain of God. And he came thither unto the cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out, and stood in the entry of the, in the, in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him that said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because of the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain the prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left to seek and they seek my life to take it away. And then we're going to read verse 18. And the Lord spoke and said, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. Father, we thank you for your word that is already anointed. We thank you for the anointed one, the Holy Spirit that is present in this place, present in me. And I pray that, Lord, you will flow through me from the very depth of my spirit where you will arise, where you will flow out of me thy own message, your own spirit, your own life, your own power, your own wisdom, knowledge, and counsel, that I may be a surrendered mouthpiece that you will use this morning only as you will. 
that you will be seen and heard, not made. That you will flow into the hearts and minds of everyone that's here, that we will have ears to hear in an anointed way, hearts to receive, lives to apply the principles of this word in our own existence that will bring us life and vitality in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody said amen. Amen. Elijah, the prophet of God, doing great work for the Lord. The one that, with the very announcement and declaration, said, as I speak, it has been going to rain for three and a half years. There's going to be drought. And I'm sure that when the prophet of the Lord said that, they thought, oh, yeah, sure, right. And so then he left the country because when it happened, and there was famine in the land, then his life would have been sought because they would blame the prophet of God that could only speak the word of God. Guess what? Prophets prophesy, folks. Yes. That's what prophets do. They prophesy. But we have no power in us to make it happen. If it is indeed the word of the Lord and the prophet will speak, we're not the ones that caused it to happen. Prophets prophesy on the word of the Lord and the Lord will hasten his word to perform it. It is a work of God and not of man. We're just the mouthpiece. But anyway, they will go after the mouthpiece and blame the mouthpiece. So he had to go in hiding for three and a half years and came back, caused the people to come back to God and said, God answered by fire when they had the two sacrifices. Let him be the God. And as we recall, and I was speaking a couple weeks ago about this, that the people didn't say a word. They just stood there. Okay. All right, it's well spoken. Sure, he's going to answer my fire. So, of course, idols don't talk. They don't move. They can't answer. So Baal couldn't answer. And then, when Elijah prayed, he called on God, and God answered by fire, consumed the sacrifice, and then he said, I hear the sound of abundance of rain. No rain for three and a half years, no crops, drought. Not a cloud in the sky, not any hope. All hope was gone. People were starving to death. Dirt in the land. Then the prophet that said that God's going to answer by fire and said he's going to answer by rain and it's going to be abundant. And we talked about him going up there praying seven times and saw a little cloud in the sky or a servant did. And then he said, I hear the sound of abundance of rain before he even prayed. And then when he heard that there was a little cloud in the sky. He said, let's get down out of this mountain before the rain stops us. And there was abundance of rain. But then when Jezebel heard about it from her husband, then she threatened the prophet's life. A mighty man of God. And he found some place that we can sometimes be in. That, oh, you know, the three and a half years didn't bother him when he had to run away to himself from Ahab the king because God was about to send a famine in the land and God protected him and God provided for him all of the time of this drought and sent him back to the country to pronounce that it was going to rain and bring the people back to God and all of them said God is God. A great revival happened in the land because their hearts returned to God knowing that God answered by fire and then knowing shortly after that same day God would cease to cause drought to be in that land and there would be an outpouring of a physical rain that would cause the drought to cease. So this was a mighty man of God. I've had people talk about their situations and and the things that they're fighting, and I remind them once in a while, you ain't Elijah. In other words, if he ran from this kind of stuff, where do you think you stand if you're going to try to 
defeat everything by yourself. You better be standing completely in faith. You better be wrapped up in the power of the Spirit of God. You better be fasting and praying and prepared for every good work or you're going to be mincemeat because it ain't all about us, folks. We're not as big as what we think we are. We're not as powerful as what we think we are. And we will find out that the test will come after a testimony in the revival and an outpouring of God. You're going to be tested. Yeah. The greatest move of God in the country in such a long time. People coming back from God and Him answering by fire and then the rain, the physical rain that ended the drought and then He fears for His life. How powerful was this word in this woman that says, I'm going to kill you tomorrow. She didn't, do you know that she did not see the prophet, hear the prophet? He heard by word of mouth. Have you ever had any fear come upon you that wasn't from the source, that was, you know, some gossip, or maybe it was real, but you heard it secondhand? What somebody's going to do to you? Threatening you? You never heard that voice. And yet we're the people of God that are bragging about the fact that we can hear the voice of God. Is there anybody out there that doesn't ever think that God speaks to you? Because I can clear that up in a moment. He said, my sheep will hear my voice. And they will follow me. You don't have to have an audible voice. It's that still, small voice that we will get to in a minute. In the very depth of your heart, he is speaking to you. He is no respect of persons. Yes, he will speak through the prophets. But he will speak to you. Now, sometimes I get in a quagmire because... Do anybody ever get in a quagmire not knowing what to do? You're in the valley of indecision. The Bible talks about the valley of decision. You know, you're standing there in the hallway. You don't know whether to go back, go forward, go to the left, go to the right. And sometimes you're just sitting there, spinning your wheels on your proverbial treadmill, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, relationally, financially, situationally. You're just not going anywhere fast. And sometimes that's the best way to be. And even better if you could turn that button off and the treadmill sitting there too because you get antsy and you know you know what to do. Then you hear some prophet tell you, go to the left. Then another one says, don't go to the left, go to the right. In times like that, I think, well, which one of these is right? And then I think, I'm not going to do any of that. I'm going to find out what God is speaking to me on the inside. And that's going to be the right voice. That's going to be the right way. And sometimes we get antsy and we want an answer for our lives through some other person rather than digging into the very presence and power of God and letting that voice that's on the inside of you, that unimpeachable voice in you, that powerful voice in you that will lead you and guide you into all truth. And then, of course, that puts it down to you making a decision based on what God has said to you through you in the very depth of your own spirit. And you have to take the responsibility and you can't blame it on somebody, what somebody said, what somebody ordered for your life. You know, the Bible says he orders our steps. So it's good to have an encouraging word, a prophetic word, and of course people are watching this video, and that's why you're watching it, because of prophetic light. And oftentimes you'll ask me for a prophetic word, and I will give you what the Lord says, maybe not what you want to hear. And I may not answer the questions that you are asking me, but when I inquire of the Lord and He speaks through me to you, He's speaking to you what He wants you to hear for that moment. And when you receive it, it will help and encourage and comfort and strengthen you for the journey that you have to take that may sometimes feel too much for you. Have you ever been in a situation where Elijah was sitting under the juniper tree running in fear for his life? I'll tell you what, fear and faith are not together. Oh yeah, they're on the same page though. Because that's a cage in the chapter of your life. So one time you may find yourself in faith and then the next 
that second you can be in fear and you're not always perfectly walking by faith, my friend. I don't know of anyone who ever has. Stop beating yourself up. Say, well, I'm like what James described, inconsistent. Bam, the devil's talking about how oh, you're inconsistent. Now you don't know what you're doing. I'll just stand there and tell them you're right. I don't. And I ain't going to do nothing until I find out from headquarters what I'm supposed to do. If I have to wait a night and a day, if I have to wait on God, I'll do that because I know who will guide my steps. I've had just about enough of doing my own going my own way, making my own decisions, and having the repercussions of them. We don't have time to hear all of that. Because you've got a list of your own factors. Because you went your own way and did your own thing, and you ran in fear and did not walk by faith. Let me tell you what, if you find yourself on the run, you're not in faith. Because faith is a walk. And faith is also many times a stand. When you stand before the threats. And I'm not telling you that you're standing like this ready to hightail it out of there. You know, when you turn your back on the problem, you guess what you're about ready to do? You're about ready to run. Get right out of dodge. Well, when you will stand in faith, the Bible says you're complete in Him. And even when you run in fear, God knows where you're at. It will always take you. It will always take you in a place of isolation. He left his servant. He had a servant that would serve him. He had a servant that he had set over the mountain and, and checked to see if there was a cloud in the sky seven times. Part of the great move of God. He left his servant and he trekked all by himself in a lonely wilderness where nothing grows and nothing produces and there's no hope. There's only certain death. Well, you know, I'm different. I don't mind. Because you're different too. Don't you want to be unique? You want to dot your eyes and cross your T's like me? I tell this story now. And I, I once in a while joke about if, if my signature doesn't have a little circle over the eye, then somebody forged my name. Because I put a little circle. Well, Kathy in the sixth grade saw me putting circles over my eyes. She had a spelling test. And she aced her test, got 100% correct, but her teacher gave her a 90% because she put circles over her eyes like her mama did, and she didn't care if she spelled the word right. She didn't dot her eye. She circled above that, and she gave her 90%. I had to throw that in. You don't need it. It may not work for you to be like me. You don't need to put circles over your eyes and cross your teeth like I do. You need to be what God has created you to be. You can be the best of yourself. You can only be the second best of somebody else. Don't follow in the footsteps of someone else or emulate them. Let's be like Jesus. Let the Christ in us flow out of us. Be unique. I chased that rabbit and I remember where I left off this time. <coughs> the uniqueness of seeing how that Elijah's sitting there under the juniper tree named after me. I didn't know thousands of years later that I would read about that tree and say, it's got my name on it. Sitting under my tree, it's probably still there. I've been there a long time. I've been there many times. I've sat in the wilderness all by myself, running in fear, running in trepidation, not seeing clearly, not knowing what I'm going to do, just running for my life, but saying, just like he said, Ugh. I know better than my 
grave. Just kill me, Lord. My life has no value. My ministry's done. I don't have anything important to do and a sad to be. I've done everything I can't do anymore. And I'm sitting there thinking about that and saying, well, why did he run from Jezebel then? If he's sitting under the juniper tree after running from his life, why is he asking the Lord to take him when she said, that day I'm going to kill you? All they had to do was just stand there and let him kill him if he was so interested in dying. Did you think about it that way? Did you ever think that here he is running from his life and telling the Lord to take him? Out! Just kill me now! I'm surprised that the angel didn't tap him and say, Hey, why didn't you just stay put? I wouldn't be here feeding you now. If you would have just stayed there, you could have faced her there, and you would have died there or lived there. What's the difference, folks? I kind of think you may play it on. Our lives are hidden him. He orders our steps. Your days are numbered before you were ever born. It's up there in heaven. You're not going to live another day, another hour, another minute beyond what you're supposed to. That's a God thing that created you for a purpose and a reason. So there isn't anything threatening you that's viable. When you belong to God and He orders your steps and He is in charge of your life, then it does take some faith. Yes, we're going to walk in fear sometimes and run in fear. We're going to go in the opposite direction that we're supposed to go. When we're supposed to stand, we will sit down. When we're supposed to speak, we will shut up. When we're supposed to shut up, we will open up our mouth and give them a piece of our mind. Come on. You, you never like that. You never like that, right? You're always going to speak at the right time and do the right thing. You're never going to embarrass yourself by opening up your mouth and speaking your own mind. Are you mad? We wouldn't do that, would we? Yeah. There are times in your life, no matter how important you are, no matter how much God has used you and worked through you, no matter how great your faith has been, you're going to find yourself running in fear rather than walking by faith. So he's running for his life and he's sitting there all depressed and down and, oh, I'm no good account and I can't do anything right and my days, my better days are behind me and I just can't do anything. Didn't matter that he called fire down from heaven. Didn't matter that he called for rain. Didn't matter that all the people said, the Lord is the God, and they turned their hearts back to him. No, he couldn't see revival, he couldn't see fire, he couldn't see rain. All he could see was his being threatened. God's bigger than the devil. When I get mad enough and upset enough, then I get nasty enough all by myself facing the enemy that taunts me, wants me to feel depressed and pushing on me. When I get mad enough, then I stand up, put my hand on my hip, walk around and look at him and say, who do you think you are? You don't get to see that. You know, good thing. You know, Dan has never called 911 on me screaming, and you can probably hear me screaming at sometimes. Uh, he, he already knows. She's all right. She's just doing spiritual warfare. It got kind of quiet, and then it got kind of loud. <laughs> and stand there, and I begin to assault the one that's been assaulting me, knowing that God is with me, and say, I don't tell him to talk to the head. I told him to talk to the one that's called alongside the help, the one that died for me, the one that stands alongside the help, the one that's within me, bigger than the devil. When he tells you who do you think you are, give it back to him. Who do you think you are, Satan? You are under my feet. We are more than conquerors, more than overcomers. Who do you think you are? 
the same wants to take you out when you're weary and tired, afraid and running. But all for ministering spirits of righteousness to come alongside and tap them on the shoulder and woke them up to substance. In the wilderness where there was no grocery store and he didn't pack a lunch, he was too, running too fast. There's an angel. Well, I'll tell you, if an angel comes and visits me, I've said that before, I said, Lord, please send me a, a nice one. I don't need a rebuke. One time I was up on the roof and, and, and it was going to rain and I had carried that five gallon bucket up the ladder and sat it on the roof of the mobile home. And my husband was in physical therapy and I left him and I had very little time to do this and I had to do the roof coping by myself and, and I was starting to cry. I'm up there and I had all the stuff up there. I started to cry. Not big tears, you know. Just started to feel sorry for myself. I said, God, can you send me an angel to help me? Can't you like send me an angel? And since I was up there on the roof, and then I stood, was standing up there, looking at that stuff and looking at what I had to do, and I said, Lord, if you're going to send me an angel, would you send me that one that's going to talk nice to me? Because I don't need a rebuke right now. they got to be nice. And Lord, you know what? If you send an angel up here and I'm standing up here on the roof and it's kind of narrow up here, I might fall off the roof. They might scare me to death. And then that's going to be the end of that, oh God. So I'm just standing there and I hadn't started yet. And the next thing I heard was somebody got pulled in my yard. I didn't look. Got out of the car, didn't look. Standing there at the bottom of the ladder, coming up the ladder, my angel for the day, Randy, says, can you give me an angel that will feel sorry for me? I don't need a rebuke, Lord, I don't need chastisement, I just need some compassion. Feel sorry for me. So he got up there and I see his face and he says, Randy, he says, what are you doing? I got a cold this roof. And he says, come on down. And he reached his hand towards me and he says, come on down off the roof right now. I can't. Why? I have to do this roof. Come on, it's going to rain. Come on down. And I, he says, do you want me to do it? And I says, maybe do you want to? And he says, yes. <laughs> and so he reaches out and his hand towards me to come down, come down right now, come down off that rope. And I says, maybe do you feel sorry for me? And he said, yes. And I knew that he was my angel for the day.
Sylvia that's seen angels and not head up. Text message from a church that I was going to go to, that I will eventually go to, uh, in another country, where they saw angels and they were lining up on the, next to the pulpit on the platform. And I said, what did they look like? And she said, big! And then she said they had full armor on. And then I said, I want to see the angels. I'm going to come back and see the angels. Eventually I will. And that will be really great experience because there will be more of them than me. I'm speaking of people. <laughs> and I will be up on a roof somewhere, ready to fall off. But here we are. In a situation where we're not walking by faith, we find ourselves in trouble and isolated. Nobody to call on your cell phone. You know what? You ain't got no towers over there. You're not going to pick up a signal. Have you ever been there where you just wanted somebody to talk to? Somebody to care? Somebody to walk with you? Somebody to console you? And you find yourself with nobody. And then you think that you're not worth a dime. Only well, went 40 days on that. He gets to more poor of the mom of God. And God says, what are you doing here? I just kind of believe that it was a nice voice. I don't think that he was ready to rebuke him and say, you idiot. You have failed. You have flopped. You are supposed to be a man of God to stand for me. And look, you're running from a woman. He never said that. The Bible says it was a still, small voice. He wasn't in all the racket. I found the greatest place for me to be is quiet. Shut up. Have you heard me in this church sometime to be silent? Do you want to know why I do that? Because in the silence, God is moving. If you, so we get so uncomfortable with silence, especially if you, you're used to racket. You know, you, you, you're in a hurry for God. And if I stand there quiet and don't say a word, if I got my hands on you and I'm just standing there and I look like an idiot, you know, I'm just waiting. Because God's going to do something. He's going to move. He's going to do something. In the silence, the quietness is the highest realm that I could ever be in in God. And I like, I like, you know, I, I'm a fighter. I'm a warrior. You know, I get loud sometimes. But, you know, there's times of this quietness that we don't understand that. But in that stillness, God speaks, moves. Greatness kind of power. So I believe he spoke to him in a still, small voice, saying, where are you? What are you doing? What are you doing here? And I'm the only one left. You ever feel like you're the only one left? I ain't been looking around. I left around. I don't see anybody. Where's, where did everybody go? Sometimes you feel like, you have, is there anybody here? I want just at least one hand. It's not going to go on the camera. Don't worry about it. We cut that camera off. Uh, we never we never do ministry on camera. I don't know. If anybody's watching this and you want ministry, you can put your hand on the camera on the last prayer that I pray, and God will move through you. He will move through that camera, and he will touch your life. And let me tell you what will happen. The fire of God will come upon you. He will bring the breaker's anointing in your life, and he will break through your darkness, and he will give you light. You will feel the fire of God come upon you. Your hands will get hot. He will heal you in the area of your knee, whether it's physical, mental, emotional. He'll do that. If you'll put your hand on the camera on faith, then he will move in your life. He will remove the obstacles in your life. He will be on scene to help you. And you don't need a physical presence. You need the presence of the Spirit of God. And He will heal your wounds. He will set you free. But in this church, we lay hands on those that want it. And God will move in your situations. 
when you will receive it. He wasn't in the wind. He wasn't in the fire. He wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the, all the racket. But he was in the still small voice. And allowed to wrap his face in his mantle, knowing that God is there. God is there in the quietness, the still small voice speaking to him, not a word of rebuke. Telling him, you think you're all alone. You think you're the only one. There's 7,000 of them. I have 7,000 of them that has never bowed to Baal, never kissed him. Seven faithful people. They may be in the north, the south, the east, and the west, but I have many that are faithful and you're not done yet. Rise to your feet and go and do the things that I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to anoint some people. I'm asking you to do some impartation. I'm asking you. So he got up and he obeyed the Lord. God wasn't finished with him. Guess what? He's not finished with you. How do you know, Pastor? Because you're alive. Are you breathing? Are you still able to speak to pray? You're able to move. Yes. And God's in the midst of you. It ain't all about me. And it ain't all about you. You're not the only one. God is still moving in and going to move through. He's got a whole bunch of people. You may not see them in your living room, your life, your car, your existence. But believe me, you're not alone. You're not the only one that will stand when others will not. You're not the only one that will speak when others will remain silent. You're not the only one that will walk by faith. And you're not the only one running in fear. You know, they say misery likes company. Do you ever want to be around somebody that's miserable? Come on, be honest. No. No, you don't. And when you're miserable, you're going to leave people. You're going to isolate yourself. I, I, I thought a good business would be pity parties. You know, they had tougher work parties and all these others. And, I thought, we'll design pity parties and we'll have black and gray things and, and we'll get some gummy worms and we'll coat them with chocolate, chocolate covered little gummy worms and call them mully grubs. <laughs> when you're down in the mully grubs, you just open up your little box of chocolate covered gummy worms and just have yourself a party. Get your box of Kleenex. <laughs> Send out the cards. Come to my pity party. And we will commiserate together. And if you're happy, you're not invited. I just want balls that are down on their luck. Because when I hear your story, it'll make mine feel not so bad. <laughs> but you know what? And, and then I was going to have these shirts that say, Misery does not like company. <laughs> Instead of misery likes company, it does not. The reality is, is when you find yourself miserable, you don't want to answer the phone. You don't want to say, hey, how are you doing? Shut up. <laughs> Leave me alone. I'm miserable. I'm depressed. I don't want that encouragement. Get out of here. Go be happy. But anyway, we find ourselves running away from people, running away from our destiny, running away in the opposite direction of where we were sent in the first place. Go back to Israel, yeah, in the desert. Hey, what you doing there? God's asking us, what are you doing there? What are you doing there? What are you doing there? And the answer is nothing. Feeling sorry for myself, not affecting anything. Grumbling, complaining, blaming. <laughs> well, come on, he was. I'm the only one left. Everybody else has turned their back on you, Lord. I'm the only one that'll stand. The only one left of all of your prophets and ministers. The only Christian left. That's not true. I love it when the Lord will, who's compassionate.
passions fail not. That our new morning by morning great is his faithfulness. You can be unfaithful to him. You can turn your back on him. You can go in the opposite direction. He remains faithful who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's dogging your tracks. Thank God for that. He knows where you're at. He knows how to speak to you. He knows how to get you back on track. Isn't that great to know that God cares about you when you don't even care about yourself? He knows the way that you take. He knows exactly when you got off track. He can get you back on. Is there anybody here that resonates with this this morning? Oh, good, somebody. Well, but I don't have to look in the mirror and preach this to myself because it used to be, it used to be, Randy, that, that my assistant pastors would say to me, did you even listen to your own sermon? You know, because Monday, bam! Sunday afternoon, wham! Yeah, I forgot what it was. What, what was it? Would you remind me again? And now I got my assistant pastor one of them, that literally emails me the prophetic word that I gave for the day. Oh, the audacity! <laughs> then he said, Pastor, have you read this word? This encouraging, powerful word from the Lord. Uh, if you have a bulletin, you got one of them on the back. Is it on the back still? You still put it in? Okay. Every day they come out prophetic light, prophetic light.org, lowercase, and there's sermons there. You know, we started this this year because God told me to do a daily word, and I do. And He told me what I could do with the gift. It has to be an encouraging word, an uplifting word, no rebuke. No bam in the face. I'm not going to talk about the world falling apart. I'm not going to talk about the sky is falling. I'm not going to talk about gloom and doom. I'm not going to be a prophet of gloom and doom. That's only going to build you up and lift you up and encourage you and propel you forward in your destiny. And if you want gloom and doom, don't come to me. I think you've got enough of it on your own. You don't need my help. Is that right? You don't need God's help to be miserable. That belongs to Satan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you want to put down, you say, hello, Satan. If you want to be lifted up, say, hello, Jesus. Because God is not in the rebuke and slapping you down even when you get off. Because we all do. He'll bring you back. Comfort you. Commission you. Who? Tell them to do something? Well, yeah, if you think you're no good account and no value at all, and then God says, Oh, baloney! What are you doing here? Get up out of this! Okay. Get busy about my business. And then when you start doing things for God and about His business, you forget about the business of your own and you're all about the Master's business nothing better than that. Right. When you start giving out of the abundance of your heart and you don't have to just deal with your flesh all the time and you're dealing with the things of the Spirit of God within your spirit, there's going to be a flow and it's going to minister to people. It's going to bring restoration to the lives of others and you won't forget about your own little feelings of despair. Isn't that true? Yes. Can you relate to that? When I feel the worst, that's when I get the most requests for prophetic stuff. Got other prophets. There are times when I came and say, Anne, will you, Anne, you're listening to this right now. Thank you, Ann Thomas is one of the prophets of prophetic life. Thank you, Susan Anderson. Thank you, Carl Thompson. Thank you for the prophecies that you give for prophetic life. 
Thank you so much, Michelle Brown. Thank you for your faithfulness to this ministry. Thank you that when I send you an email and ask you to take some of these prophecy requests, you do them faithfully and powerfully. And God is greatly using you in your gift. And it astounds me how God is causing you to grow and using you radically. And it touches my life. But anyway, once in a while, I, I give away a few more than I probably should. Because I just, oh, I don't want to prophesy to them. <laughs> But there are other times when the prophetic word just flows out of me. And then when I'm done giving these messages, and especially when you get the feedback that it was right on point exactly what they needed at that time, then it lifts you. Isn't that true? When you give out of the abundance of your heart, then it's going to lift you. Next time I see Dan feeling kind of bad, I'll just go in there, Dan, can you help me with <laughs> This is just hollering all help. And I, I, I immediately start screaming right in the middle of my yard. Is that true? Ah! <laughs> I, I usually don't pester myself. He volunteers and then he says, Thank you for letting me do this for you. <laughs> That's a man of God. That's a man after God's own heart. We're going to pray. Raise your hand if this resonates with you, that sometimes you find yourself not walking in faith, you're running in fear, you feel isolated and alone, you feel useless and worthless at these times, sometimes you feel like you're the only one. There's nobody there for you. Ah, I see hands. Well, I'm going to ask you to let me minister to you this morning. Is that okay? To say, okay, pastor. Okay. Amen. Because it's not going to be the pastor that's doing it. And when I lay hands on you, something's going to supernaturally take place in you. And it's God about me. Don't give me the credit to God be the glory all the time. Because I cannot heal, repair, revive, restore, renew. I can't do that, but he can and will. Yes. Father, we thank you. Those that are listening to this, Whatever country you're in, whatever state that you find yourself in, not the United States of America, but I'm talking about your situations. Let the Holy Spirit come upon you right now. Be still. Be still. And know that I am God in the midst of you. Be still and know that I am speaking expressly unto you. That I see your turmoil. I see your frustrations. I see your loneliness. And I even see your despair, says the Lord. But I To bring you life, to bring you vitality, to encourage you and lift you up. Just reach out to me, says the Lord, for I am already reaching out to you. Let your hand be extended towards me in faith, and I will reach you. I will lift you. I will help you, says the Lord. And I will surround you with my love. And I will lead you one step at a time. For you are not forsaken. I have not turned my back upon you, nor can I, nor will I. And your circumstances do not frighten me. They cannot intimidate me, says the Lord, who has created you, who has recreated you, who has given you new life. And I will, I will, I will, says the Lord. I will honor my word. I will honor you. I will bring 
and even deliver you from the things that you have spoken concerning yourself. For I am speaking, I am moving, and I am bringing life and hope, vitality and healing to you as you trust me, as you open up your heart and you receive it, says the Lord. And I will bring you out. I will bring you over. I will bring you up to a new level and commission in me, says the Lord. <laughs>